Good morning. I'll be talking about uh, technology uh, this morning. Uh, technology, which I think is one of the most exciting and the forefront of uh, science and technology that has the potential of changing transportation as, as we know it, changing the way cities are going to be designed. And I'm talking about autonomous uh, driving. And that there has been lots of uh, talk about autonomous driving in the past uh, few years. And I'll focus on you know, what are the key questions that needs to be resolved in order to see that <clears throat> going into uh, mass, uh, going into that, in, into mass production. But uh, I'll start with a short uh, clip just to create a baseline. This is a um, demonstration we have done together with uh, one of our partners, uh, Delphi, back at the Consumer Electronics Show half a year ago. We set up a vehicle that drove hands-free, completely autonomous, inside the city of Las Vegas, a route of about uh, 10 kilometers, has driven about 400 rounds without making a single uh, mistake. And there were many reporters and, and, and customers uh, sitting in, in, in the vehicle. And one of the reporters made a short uh, clip. So let me start with this, and then I'll explain what is really the fundamental open issues that needs to be, needs to be resolved. I'm here at CES, where I've just taken a ride in the latest version of Delphi's autonomous research vehicle. This is an Audi SQ5 that Delphi has fitted with radar, LiDAR, and what's new for this generation is a camera system from partner Mobileye. That means nine cameras around the vehicle that give this car a better sense of its surroundings. During the drive on a set route, this car acted very naturally. It was aggressive enough, but safe enough. It felt like a human was behind the wheel. There's a display in the car that showed me what the car was seeing. I could see when it could see pedestrians, crosswalks, traffic lights. It really had a great sense of its surroundings. One thing that really impressed me is while we were in a left turn lane, another car cut in front of us and the Delphi car behaved perfectly. Another time we also went through a fairly long tunnel. The car lost its GPS connection but still stayed on course. And one final thing that really impressed me is that this car uses crowdsourcing to determine its path down the road. It sees the path that similarly equipped cars have taken before it, and so it follows that path as well as lane lines. Okay, so this is just to, to set the, uh, the baseline. And, and what I want to focus now is obviously you see something that is part of a science project. It's a huge experimental project being done by us and being done by many other uh, actors in, in the field for a number of, uh, of years. And the question is, is, what do we need to do as an industry and society to take this into mass uh, production? And there are fundamental questions that some of them are quite open and not up to a serious uh, debate of what do we need to do to take demonstrations like we have seen here and move it into a mass uh, production. So, I would focus on two questions, and, and, and they're very fundamental. One is about safety, safety guarantees, because we're talking about machines that have the potential of doing a lot of good, like saving lives, but have also the risk of doing quite bad, like taking lives. And society will accept the former, would not accept the latter. And the question is, is what kind of guarantees we as an industry, together with regulatory bodies, need to put on the table in order that society will accept these machines on, on the road. And, and this is a, a really fundamental uh, problem. The second very important question has to do with, with economy. We need a system that is scalable, system that is scalable in terms of the infrastructure that is needed in order to put them on the road, in terms of the cost of, uh, per vehicle, the maintenance of, of these uh, vehicles, whether they need external type of, uh, of infrastructure like communication, like uh, maps, how all of this is done in a way which is scalable. It means we can run them everywhere on the world and not in a specific neighborhood in which we show demonstrations. So those are two really fundamental questions and without solving them, we will not see autonomous driving in mass production. We'll continue seeing clips like this by myself and by others, but we'll not really see millions of cars being produced in mass, uh, in mass production. And, and some of these are, are very fundamental and so far have not been open so much for uh, a debate. So be before I, I go deeper into this, just divide the technology into three different areas, three different uh, pillars. 
Some of them are obvious, some of them are less obvious. The obvious one has to do with the sensing. In order to enable an autonomous uh, a car, you need eyes, like biological systems have sight in order to navigate the world. So we're talking about cameras, radars, laser scanners, which are called uh, uh, LADARs, uh, high-performance uh, computing, receiving all this high-bandwidth raw data into uh, computer chips, system on chips, very sophisticated artificial intelligence software to interpret the raw data into high-level percepts, such as vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, uh, lanes, their, their uh, semantic uh, meaning, uh, path uh, delimiters, traffic signs, traffic lights, and so forth. 360 degrees around the car. So this is a necessary condition. Without sensing, you cannot enable autonomous cars. The second part is, has to do with, uh, with mapping, and this is a bit less obvious because people don't need maps in order to drive. They need maps to navigate, but not to drive. But machines do. And we're talking about a different kind of maps. These are very detailed maps called high-definition maps in which it provides redundancy. So the, the robotic system has, understands the world through its sensors, but also has a very, very detailed map in order to create redundancy between, it, between what it sees and what it, has, it knows as prior information. It also gives a, a foresight. We can know where the path leads to way into the future, way beyond what sensors can, can tell you. And this is a necessary, necessary condition to have robust, uh, robust performance of autonomous driving. And the map creates issues of scalability. How do you build the maps? Today, they are done with a lot of manual uh, labor with specialized equipment. And how do you update uh, these maps? If these maps are critical for safety, then they need to be true continuously. So if something changes in the environment, we need the map to reflect that change instantaneously. So how do you guarantee that? How do you create maps that are reflecting the, uh, the environment accurately all the time? So th this is both technology and Logistics, how do we create scalability? The third part is where safety comes in. Well, part of the safety comes in is driving policy. It's all about predicting the future, deciding what commands, what actions to take, whether we want to accelerate or whether, whether we want to change lane, overtake a vehicle, all the, all the actions we do in order to merge into traffic. And, and we know it is complicated because we humans, we take driving lessons in order to learn that. It's a form of negotiation. That, uh, that we do. We do not talk with other agents. We, our motion signals to the other agents on the road our intentions, and their motions signals to us their intentions. And somehow we miraculously merge into traffic. I'm talking about dense uh, traffic. Merge into traffic uh, in, in, in a safe manner most, most of the time. And one of the big challenges here is, on one hand, we would like to enable human-like negotiation, human-like driving, because if the autonomous car is too defensive in its driving, it is very slow and, and very conservative, then these cars will block traffic, especially in dense cities like here in Seoul. They'll block traffic. If you have one or two test cars, it's fine, but if you have thousands of these, then no city would want these cars to roam in their streets and will block traffic. So on one hand, we would like to enable human-like performance, but on the other hand, humans are involved in accidents. So we want to guarantee safety. And this is a conflict. How do we guarantee safety at levels much, much better than, than humans and still behave like humans in terms of uh, negotiation skill and, and uh, nimbleness? So th th those are the, the issues. So let me start with just explaining, giving you an idea, what does it mean to negotiate? You, you have all experienced it, but now let's look at it. So I took a drone above my route to work. It is in Israel, so it's aggressive, but yesterday I, I've, I've drove in Seoul, and Seoul is also aggressive. So let's look about a bit of negotiations here in, in, back in Israel. So the car here is kind of squeezing in into traffic. The next car that you see here in the circle is going to try to merge into traffic, but no one is going to let him in. And we're going to speed this up, and this poor guy or woman is going to get stuck there and not succeed in their merge. Okay? So we have to be open to the fact that we have desires when we're negotiating, and not always those desires are met. This poor long truck would have to plan ahead for minutes, 
like at some point we are accelerating, fast forwarding the clip until it gets uh, more gentle traffic. So these are the kinds of situations where robotic cars need to maneuver, not well designed and, and simple, simple routes. Let's look at another uh, situation. It's called a double merge. And what you're going to see here happens. We didn't have to wait a, a long time to see something like this happen. You know, they, they don't collide. There's no accident. But clearly, there was a conflict in the negotiation. And uh, so we don't have audio. We don't hear them shouting at one another. But this is, these are the kinds of things that, that we need to handle if we send a robotic car out there. So we see it's complicated. So on one hand, it's complicated. On the other hand, what do we do with accidents? Right, we would like human-level negotiation, but we would like not to have accidents. So maybe, maybe it's too much of a condition, maybe few accidents. But if it's few accidents, who is liable? You know, the poor car manufacturers that are going to put cars on the road are going to be liable, then there will not be an industry. So th there's here a fundamental question of how do we, on one hand, enable human-level negotiation, on the other hand, provide guarantees that society can, uh, can accept. So I'm, I'm going to say a few words about a new, a new white paper that, that we published. It's a very theoretical, and I'm going to highlight uh, what are the, the interesting items, items there that are relevant to this kind of uh, audience. So when you talk about safety, safety in autonomous, in, in automotive, is all about system integrity. It's all about hardware. I'm talking about a different type of safety. Let's call it multi-agent safety. And this is kind of the probability of the car involved in an accident. And it's not because of a, a bit flipped in the system on chip. It is because of high-level decisions of planning and, and sensing. So there are two sources of errors. One is miscalculating a planning maneuver. The robotic car decided to change lane, cut into another vehicle's path, do it in an aggressive manner, and uh, created an accident. So this is a planning mistake. Another one is a sensing mistake. The sensors did not see the vehicle ahead, and the, the robotic car hit the vehicle ahead. So when you look about these mistakes, the traditional wisdom today, and this is kind of commonly accepted and not challenged, is that the validation of safety is data-driven. It means that the more kilometers, the more miles you drive, the higher your confidence in the maturity of the system. And if you drive enough kilometers, say 3 million kilometers, 4 million uh, kilometers, then you say, OK, I'm done. I've shown that in those millions of uh, kilometers, there were no accidents. Therefore, my system is, is validated. And if you think that 4 million kilometers is not enough, then I'll drive another million kilometers, OK, so that you'll be happy. This is, this is the state of of the industry today. And, and what I want to point, point out is a simple thought experiment to show you that this is very, very, very wrong. And if we continue that way, there will not be any autonomous cars on, on, on the road. And then I'll offer a solution. So let's do the following thought experiments. We know that the probability of a, of a fatality of a person getting killed in an accident for one hour of driving is one to a million. Now, one to a million sounds good. Okay. But now let's look at the number of fatalities we have in the US. I don't know how much in, in South Korea, but I know in the US, it's about 35,000 people die every year from accidents. So now let's do the following thought experiment. Let's assume that we go to society, and we tell them we're going to replace humans with machines, and machines are going to kill 35,000 people every year. All right, it, it, it will not work. Let's do better. Let's go to society and tell them they are going to kill 10,000 people a year. So one third, this sounds very, very good. From a rational thinking, we have been doing society a big service. But 10,000 people killed by computers, this would also not work. Right? So the number, if it's 10, 20, can work. Right? Because those are the number also of people be being killed by wrong deployments of airbags today. So in that case, we're talking about three orders of magnitude. It means the desire for a robotic car to prove that a fatality per one hour of driving is 1 to a billion, 10 to the minus 9. Now, to appreciate what is 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 9 is the probability that an airplane wing will detach spontaneously during flight. OK? So we're talking about serious numbers here.
Now, why, why all these numbers are important? Because you can prove the following claim, that if you want to guarantee that the probability of event per hour is p, where p is some small number, you must drive at least 1 over p after every update of your planning uh, software. So if p is 10 to the minus 9, 1 over p is 10 to the power of 9. So you'll need to drive 10 to the power of 9 hours of driving in order to validate the system. Okay? And, and this, is, this, is, this is science. I'm not talking about hype. Now, what is 10 to the power of 9? Let's assume that on average you drive 30 kilometers. So 10 to the power of 9 is 30 billion kilometers. It's not the 3 or 4 million kilometers that people talk about. Now, to show you how, how ridiculous this is, this 30 billion kilometers, let's look at cost. Let's look at data cost. We know that about an hour of driving with surround cameras, radars, ladders generate about 5 terabytes. I'm talking about test cars. So 10 to the power of 9 hours generate about 5 mega petabytes. Today, a petabyte, including computing, hot storage, combination of hot storage, cold storage, is about $400,000. So we're talking about roughly $2 trillion just to handle the data. Next, let's look at equipment cost. 4 million cars driving 20 hours a day will drive 10 to the power of 9 hours. Right. If you want less cars, then you'll have to do more than one year. Let's assume it's $100,000 per test car, and this is an uh, underestimation. We're talking about almost half a trillion billion of dollars just off for equipment, and then go hire 4 million drivers. Okay, so we're talking about things that are clearly unfeasible if you want to guarantee the numbers that I mentioned before. And as I said before, if you don't guarantee those numbers, society eventually will not accept this. So this is why when we, we thought about it, and, and these kinds of thinking, the revelation came after the clip that I've shown you. So we succeeded in doing a very, very challenging city driving in, in Las Vegas, and reporters that have been sitting in the car and people that have also witnessed other actors in this field with their test cars came to us and said, you have the best. And then I told myself, OK, what now? Clearly, we cannot go into mass production with this, not in terms of the cost and not in terms of the safety uh, guarantees. So I have to think about safety before we go and invest billions of dollars in completing this kind of technology. So what we come to the conclusion that safety has to be model-based. It has to be interpretable and explainable. Also, not only because of the, the problem problem of acquiring such, such a big mass of validation data it is also because if somebody gets killed, we need to explain why. You cannot say it was a black box that was trained 30 billion kilometers and this poor guy got, got killed. Right? We have to be able to explain it. Another complication that comes here is that absolute safety is not, uh, is not possible. Just to, to understand this, you know, the blue car in the center is trapped. If the car uh, on the left uh, hits him, the blue car cannot do anything because it's surrounded by other cars. And this kind of situation happens all the time in dense, in, in dense highway. We cannot prevent the situation. So saying that there will not be an accident is simply impossible to, uh, uh, to guarantee. But we need to guarantee something else. And, and the way to think about it is when there is an accident, there is an investigation. And the result of the investigation is to find out who's to blame. Because normally in an accident, it's not symmetric. It's one agent that caused the accident. Right? So what we need to guarantee is that autonomous cars would not be involved in accidents of their blame. This is something that is possible to, uh, to guarantee. And the idea is that let's set the blame in advance, because we're talking about machines. So a model which we call responsibility sensitive safety in RSS, we set the rules of blame in advance. So, uh, that you, you, you kind of picture it, we are formalizing the common sense of who is responsible for an accident in, in a mathematical model so that one can follow it, define it very, very accurately, and then go to regulatory bodies and start engaging with them about this model. So try to formalize blame in advance and not after each accident there is an investigation and a lot of media attention because an autonomous car was, was involved and this kind of media attention will put pressure on regulatory bodies. They'll, they'll start issuing guidelines that will basically stifle a technological uh, progress. So set the rules of the blame in advance. And then there's a concept we developed called safe state. It is a state in which the 
the, the, the robotic car cannot cause an accident of its blame regardless of what other agents are doing. That means I don't need to know what is the intentions of other agents. I can guarantee that if I'm in that state, whatever they do, I will not form an accident. And, that, and I'll show an example of this. And then a method for verifying that the robotic car transitions only between safe states. So if in each safe state we cannot get involved in an accident of our blame, and if we move from state to state and guarantee that we are moving only between safe states, then we can then prove that we will never cause an accident of our, of our blame. So to, to get an idea of how this works, let's look at the three very, very simple scenarios that we are all familiar. One of them is we are following in a car. So we are the car in, in behind, we are the rear car following the car in front. So the, the parameters that, that we need to think about is the response time of the robotic car. Since we're talking about the machine, we know what is the response time of the machine. The road conditions, whether it's wet or dry. Since we have sensors, we know what is the road uh, conditions, either by sight, by, by all sorts of stability control uh, uh, technology that's in the car. We can know what is the road conditions. The velocities of both vehicles, we know, we can measure. The maximum deceleration that the robotic car can, uh, can withhold, can withstand. We also know that. So we know all these numbers, so we can calculate what is the safe distance between the car in front, such that if the car in front applies emergency braking at maximal force, say 1G force, we will not hit it. So this is an example of a, uh, of a safe state. Now, you, you could imagine that this will cause very, very defensive driving. Well, no. Let's assume that we're driving 100 kilometers per hour at the same speed and with a response time of 200 milliseconds, the distance, the safe distance is only 5 meters, 5.5 meters. Normally at such speeds, we maintain a much, much larger distance. So you can drive aggressively and still maintain a safe state. Similarly, when we're cutting in, we can do the calculations of what is the corridor of the car that we're cutting in, make an assumption to be uh, engaged with regulatory bodies, what is the slowdown speed of the car that I'm cutting in, could be 0.1 G, 0.05 G, it's a number to be agreed with regulatory bodies. What is the response time, a human response time, whether one second, half a second, again, agree with regulatory bodies, and then calculate what should be the safe distance when we cut in another vehicle. Now, this is important because this kind of blame definition allows for aggressiveness with a tolerance agreed with regulatory, uh, regulatory board, uh, bodies during lane change. Because normally what people assume is that all agents continue with their same velocity. If that is the assumption, then I never can change lane. Because in a dense, dense traffic, nobody, there's no opening for me to change lane. I need to make an assumption, me as a human, when I drive, we make assumptions that when we squeeze in, the car behind will slow down. And these assumptions involve similar considerations that I said before. What we're saying here is that we're going to formalize these assumptions and have it agreed with regulatory bodies, and that allows us to be in a safe state also when we change, also when we change lane. Similar is when we have uh, dealing with limited sensing. Let's assume that I'm driving and between two parked cars there is a child. Right? If I hit the child, I'm to blame, regardless of why the child or the adult uh, jumped in between the two part cars. But now I can make another assumption to be agreed with regulatory bodies. What is the maximum velocity of an object jumping out between two parked cars? There is a maximal velocity. It can't be infinite. Once I know that, what that maximum velocity is, I can calculate what should be my speed of driving and lateral distance, maximum lateral distance from the parked cars, such that if some, something jumps out at the maximum velocity, so I'm taking a worst case analysis, I will not hit it. Right? And again, you may think that this would cause a, very, cause a very, very defensive driving, but no. If you put maximum human speed, you can still drive at, at human-like speeds in, in, in cities. So you, you, can't, you start seeing that we're talking about a formal model with definitions that has parameters. These parameters need to be agreed with regulatory bodies, but once this is agreed, we have a formal definition of, of blame. And then we are talking about the uh, concept of uh, route priorities and so forth. I'll, I'll skip this uh, slide. And then there is additional scenarios, two-way traffic, traffic lights, unstructured roads, all, all part of this, uh, of, the, of this model. 
Then there is a NHTSA, uh, the American regulatory body. It's a crash typology, covers 99.4% of all crashes, studying 6 million accidents. And we took our model, and it covers all the 37 different uh, accidents. So, so the model uh, looks like it is, uh, it is complete. And, and then comes, OK, so this is a safe state. If I'm in this state, I'll, I cannot cause an accident. But now, how do I move from state to state? So the, the question is, what are the constraints on actions so that we move from safe state to safe state? That means we'll never cause an accident. A brute force approach, checking all future outcomes, again, will not be feasible. And it's a non, not, it's a not, the question is not obvious, because there could be a butterfly effect. I could do an innocent action right now, which could, over time, explode into a catastrophe and create an accident. So one needs to show that in these constraints of our actions, everything is local from a temporal standpoint. The decision I make now, based on local considerations, it has a guarantee for a long-term effect that it will not cause an accident. So uh, we have here a concept of a default emergency policy, which is the most aggressive braking and heading towards the center of the, of the lane. And then a safe state, which is safe if performing such a uh, default emergency uh, policy does not lead to an accident. And then a concept of cautious commands is how do we do actions that maintain a safe state regardless of what other agents do. So putting this together, we have, uh, we have a framework, a formal framework that on one hand defines in a formal manner the rules of blame. And again, this has to be engaged with the regulatory bodies. This is, this is a place where the industry and regulatory bodies can start engaging where there is a formal model as a starting point to set these parameters of the rules of, of blame. And then there is a method one can have another method, but this is our method, to, to guarantee that we are always in a safe state, that once all our actions take us from a safe state to a safe state, such that in each safe state, we are guaranteed not to create an accident. So uh, let me show you a kind of a, a simulator of a complicated maneuver called the double merge, where the red cars need to merge right, the white cars need to merge uh, left. And, and you can see that the cars are driving human-like in terms of their speed. Uh, it's uh, dense traffic. And the model guarantees that none of them are going to be involved in an accident. So you can, you can drive human-like, yet create guarantees without creating 30 billion kilometers of driving that would be accepted by society, first be accepted by regulatory bodies, and because it's a model that's ex explainable, one can explain it to society. What are the rules of the game when there is an autonomous car on, on, on the road? So unlike empirical models and simulators, this model is about guarantees. It's not an empirical testing. It is a formal guarantee under rules to be agreed with uh, regulatory bodies of this model. And it, uh, this requires an intimate collaboration with the regulatory uh, bodies. And first, to accept the notion of blame, to accept the definitions of, uh, of blame, and set out a way to certify autonomous car according to this uh, model. And then once we have a certified car, we are guaranteed not to have made a planning decision that will cause an accident. What is left are mistakes that are caused by sensing. And here you can show that in the context of fusion, where you have three sensor modalities, the amount of data that you need to, uh, to collect is capped by 10 to the power of five hours of driving, 100,000 hours of driving, which is reasonable. It's about three million uh, uh, kilometers. This is something that is uh, reasonable. And then you can get to the 10 to the minus nine uh, guarantee. So this is about uh, safety guarantees. Let me talk a bit about economic uh, scalability, which is another area that if it is not resolved properly, if we approach the creation of autonomous cars in a brute force way, brute force meaning cost and infrastructure that is needed to support autonomous cars, then there will not be economical justification for autonomous cars, even though they will be safe. And if there's not an economical justification, all the kinds of activities that we and others are doing in autonomous cars will gradually phase out, will gradually die out, because there's not going to be economical justification for it. See, remember that the whole thing started with studies showing 
that in mobility on demand, like Uber, Lyft, mobility on demand, the cost of the driver is 50% of the equation. If you remove the driver, you save 50% of the cost. That creates an economical incentive for developing this technology. But if you are removing the driver and then plugging in something else that requires a lot, a lot of cost, then we are changing the equation. And all of a sudden, this becomes a science project and not, and not an industry. With an industry, we need economical uh, viability. So that there are a number of, of, of issues that, uh, that touch on economical scalability. And, and one of the major ones is mapping. So we, we need to build maps that are very, very detailed. We need to locate ourselves in these maps at an accuracy of about 10 centimeters. So GPS will not give us uh, uh, a solution, especially not in dense uh, cities. And today, the, the traditional method of creating these maps are very manual labor, specialized equipment. Bandwidth of data is huge. It's about one gigabyte of data per kilometer of, of accumulating uh, data. So it is fine if you want to do a test. I can take part of a city of Seoul, map it over time, spend a lot of money of mapping it, and then show tests. But if I want to have an industry, I want to be able to drive autonomously everywhere, then I need to solve this issue. How do we build and update these maps uh, in a cost-effective way? And the, the initiative that we started a year and a half ago, we announced that at CS 2016, and then we have a, a number of uh, a car makers as partners for this uh, initiative, and, and the number of, and number of partners are, are growing as, as, as we speak, is to use crowdsourcing, is to use the fact that driving assist, driving assist today is technology for preventing accidents, a collision avoidance technology, lane, lane detection and, and vehicle and pedestrian detection to avoid uh, collisions. And almost every new car in the developed world is coming out with a front-facing camera for driving assist. And most of them are coming with mobile technology behind it. 2017, we're about close to 9 million chips, so 9 million cars with our technology. So we'd like to leverage this. We put software in the chip behind, which is processing the information coming from the camera. And the purpose of this new software is to collect critical data. What is this data? On one hand, it is landmarks, anything that is stationary in the world. It could be pavement markings, like the arrows on the road. It could be traffic signs, traffic lights, poles, reflectors. Everything that is stationary in, in the world is being collected and recognized. And then the camera also picks the lanes and, and understands the, the semantic meaning associated with the lanes. All of this is packed into a 10 kilobyte per kilometer packet. So if you're driving 100 kilometers, it's one megabyte. If you drive 20,000 kilometers per year, it's 200 megabytes. Sending 200 megabytes to the cloud is about half a dollar today. So we're talking about very, very realistic uh, cost. This data goes to the cloud. And in the cloud, it is being stitched together into a very, very detailed map automatically. So there are three technologies going on here. One is the harvesting, the software in the car, collecting the data, sending it to the cloud. Aggregation is fusing all these pieces of data into a very detailed map. And then localization is also software in the car that finds those landmarks, matches them to the landmarks in the map, and localizes the car at very, very high accuracy. So just to give you an idea how this uh, it looks like, this is part of the route in the Las Vegas uh, uh, demo. The lines that you see on the left-hand pane are projection of map data into the image. And, and you see that, they lo look at the purple lines. The purple lines are sitting exactly where the physical lanes on the road are. So this shows you the accuracy. It's the accuracy of the map data and the accuracy of localization. Because if you are not able to localize yourself in the map accurately, these purple lines would be shifted. They'll not sit exactly where the lanes are. On the right, you have projection to Google Earth, also to give you a sense of uh, accuracy. And if we run this, you can see how the lines are sitting exactly on the true lane marks and curbs on the road, like the yellow line there, at accuracy of a few centimeters. Okay. And, and, and this shows uh, how the concept works. The next uh, clip shows a project, uh, a, pr a production program we're doing with the Nissan. 
for level three autonomous cars. It's together with the Zengrin, the map maker, and the project is to map all of Japan's highways, highways and primary roads, by middle of 2018, using this uh, technology to enable highway, highway autonomous uh, driving by early 2019 at uh, speeds, significant uh, speeds. The partners in, this and, and, in all this mapping uh, activity is uh, Volkswagen, BMW, uh, Nissan, and we have a relatively large number of car manufacturers that within months are joining this kind of a consortium of sending data and, and using this data to build uh, maps. 2018, there'll be about 2 million cars in production sending data for building maps. So this shows how we can take in a problem that is very, very expensive, building maps, updating uh, the maps, and creating a very scalable system in terms of its cost by leveraging cooperation among all players in this uh, field. Because there are millions of cars being produced with front-facing camera, you can leverage that, rather than using specialized equipment to create your own, your own maps. Uh, finally, a few elements that uh, are related to scalability I'll skip this one. I'll just go into the hardware uh, element. We are also uh, building a system on chips. The IQ4 system on chip coming out in serious production by more than 10 different car manufacturers early 2018. It's a very powerful system on chip, which is about 2.5 tera operations per second running deep networks at a very low power, about uh, 6 watts. And, and power consumption is, is important, especially in the era where autonomous driving and electrical vehicles are coupled. Autonomous drivings are going to be in electrical vehicles for all sorts of reasons. They are coupled. Now, the power consumptions of the electronics in the car affect the range that, that you can enable an uh, electric vehicle. So you need very, very low power consumption not to, get, not to be getting into a, a liquid uh, cooling and expensive uh, hardware infrastructure in order to create scalability. IQ5 is being uh, sampled for silicon middle of 2018, and it will be 10 times the computing density, so 24 tera operations per second at 12 watts. Again, very, very low power uh, consumption. A level five, level 5 autonomous car would be powered by simply two IQ5 chips, and another uh, powerful CPU by, by Intel, and that's it. So we're talking about very, very scalable hardware to run very, very sophisticated uh, performance. OK, so if I summarize, I, I touched, about, I touched on, on two very fundamental uh, issues that normally people don't talk about. Normally, people will show you about sensing, about issues related to sensing, like a policeman directing traffic and the robotic cars need to recognize that there is a police car. A policeman needs to recognize the hand waving of the policeman and, and so forth. Or a bicyclist waving his hand in order to merge into traffic. All of those issues are not that complicated. The complicated real issues have to do with acceptance of society of this technology. And without having society accept the technology, there will not be mass production. And what is needed is safety, safety guarantees. And the common wisdom of collecting data will reach, will hit a wall. Just by the simple thought experience I shared, uh, I shared with you. And one needs to think about it differently. And this requires a very, very tight collaboration between industry players and regulatory bodies, and to have a model in which to engage. And what I show, this RSS model that we made public for the specific reason of creating an effort of standardization, not only for us, but for everyone in this uh, industry. And this type of standardization does not favor our technology. This is across, uh, across uh, the board. In order, to, in order to direct regulators to thinking about what would really be helpful in making society adopt this uh, technology. And second is the economic uh, scalability. You know, with all good intentions, you know, we can create these machines that will be safe, but if there's not going to be economical reason to replace humans on the road, then it will not happen. 
and economical scalability is, is critical. And I gave an example of, uh, of building the maps, uh, designing the chips as two economical, uh, uh, economical sources. There is another one which has to do with planning that I skipped because of uh, time. But anyone who's interested can search Google uh, the title of this paper and, and have a look. It's explained there. So I, I finish here, and I'll be happy to engage in a Q&A about this. Thank you. <clears throat> Speaking to the entrepreneurs in the audience, I love to know more about you, about your journey, why Intel. Um, so if we could talk about, I was on a panel earlier, and we're talking about failure, how we accept failure in the valley, Silicon Valley, and and some places of the world, if you fail, you're done. So I want to weave in also if you failed during your journey. And I have a dear friend on the board of Intel, David Patrick. I remember when he was talking about bringing Intel to, mm -hmm. to obviously Tel Aviv. And also I'm very sorry to hear, say that dear friend of mine, CEO, just died last week, Paul Olini. Paul died in his sleep at 66 years old. You must, did Paul, was he part of the team that blessed the acquisition? Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, the CEO of, uh, of Intel, Brian Krasanich, he was the driving force and the board were the driving force behind, uh, behind the deal. Unfortunately, I've never met uh, Paul uh, Ottolini. I think you, you raised a number of uh, questions that, that could occupy a significant uh, time, and I think all of them are interesting. First, why, why Intel? acquisition and about failure. I think failure is a very, very interesting uh, topic because it is culture-based and uh, Israel has a lot to say about, uh, about failure. So let, let's start with why, with why Intel. So Mobileye was founded in 1999, so an 18-year-old uh, company, uh, very, very profitable. So when at the day of closing, which was two months ago, Mobileye had $1 billion in the bank. So it is not because of the money that we uh, joined uh, the Intel family. It is because we understood, and by the way, Mobileye uh, was a publicly traded company, so we, we uh, floated the company at the New York Stock Exchange August 2014 at a value of a market cap of $5.5 billion. So we were a public uh, company moving from driving assist, which is all about creating a product based on a front-facing sensing, front-facing camera, also fusion with radar, to avoid collisions, and we were very successful in, in our pursuit. We became the, the leading company in our, in, our, in, in our space. And moving toward autonomous driving, and what we realized that when you, when you start thinking about autonomous driving, it's not a product, it's an industry. It's interdisciplinary. You're not only talking about computer vision, artificial intelligence, system on chips. You are talking about infrastructure of mapping. I just explained here how we go and build maps. So we're talking about cloud computing. We're talking about very sophisticated agreements with the car industry. We're talking about interaction with regulatory bodies. We're talking about 5G communication. We're talking about data centers. How could a company of the size of 650 people do all of this? It was clear to us that we need, this is the time to join to join into an umbrella of a very strong engineering company. Mm -hmm. So it's not about lack of money resources. With $1 billion, you can do quite a lot. But it's lack of resources. It's manpower resources, infrastructure resources, clout. You want to start and engaging with regulatory bodies. The size of Mobileye is sufficient to interact with the Israeli regulatory body. But to interact with worldwide regulatory bodies, the size of a company like Intel can do that. You have the cloud. So it was clear to us that we need now to move into chapter two of the life of the company. And chapter two would be together with a technological engineering uh, giant. And luckily, we, we built it in a way that does not stifle the entrepreneurship uh, spirit of, of the company, the startup spirit of the company, the way we built it is that Mobileye took underneath it all of Intel's existing activity in autonomous driving, the ADG group, autonomous driving group. That division is now reporting to me. I'm a senior vice president of, uh, of Intel, reporting directly to the CEO, to Brian Krasanich. 
so that we have a, a single voice, a single face, a single thrust to build autonomous uh, cars. Uh, and without, without us, Mobileye, losing the, the startup uh, spirit. So Mobileye remained Mobileye. It's a subsidiary of, of Intel. And we simply received more, uh, more resources. A day after uh, closing, which was uh, two months ago, we immediately received about 200 engineers from Intel Israel. Intel has about 10,000 employees in Israel. So they have a significant uh, position in Israel, which was also one of the reasons we thought Intel would be an attractive company to merge into. Those 200 engineers immediately started working on opening our next generation chip, the IQ5, with an SDK to allow third party people to program the chip and start designing our next generation chip that will come two years uh, later. There are about 500 more engineers located in multiple sites uh, that we are now gradually bringing under our uh, umbrella and uh, using that to accelerate, mm -hmm. uh, to accelerate our activity. Another thing that we immediately did, which is something we could not have done as, as Mobileye independent company, we are building now a fleet of 100 vehicles, uh, test vehicles, which both collect data and start experimentation and would reduce cost to our customers because the data that we collect is data that is, that is available to our customers, is data that is available for validating our customers' uh, fleets. Mm -hmm. And this is a significant investment. And this is something that a, a company of the size of Mobileye could not have done. Now, 10 vehicles, yes, but not 100. But as part of the Intel family, we can do. So this is about why Intel. I'm intrigued about your question about failure, because you now there was a there's a very interesting book about Israel it's called Israel Startup Nation, and the book was written by non-Israelis, by two authors, uh, U.S. Uh, US based uh, authors, and sometimes you you can gain insight when someone from the outside looks at you, yes. and and th there were a number of points that were obvious to us, but number of points that were not. You know, the point that was obvious is about the value of the military experience. In, in, in Israel, like in uh, South Korea, the, there's a mandatory uh, uh, service. service. And uh, for boys, it's uh, three years, and for women, it's uh, t two, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And it's a very uh, a building uh, experience. But all of that we knew. There were two other elements that were mentioned in the book that was new to us. Once you read it, it's obvious, but it was new to us. One of them is about failure. In the Israeli culture, and the Israeli ethos, it's okay to fail. It's not okay to fail because of negligence, but it's okay to fail because you try to do something ambitious and it didn't work out. It doesn't go against you. So you started a company, you did your best, you failed. Then people say, okay, this guy or woman, they have experience. Next time, let's invest in them for the next time because next time they'll not to do the same mistakes that they have done the first time. So you don't lose face. It doesn't go against you. Another point that was mentioned there that was also new to us is that it's lack of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Israeli, Israeli culture is flat. It means an employee of mine can come to me and tell me, I think you are wrong in A, B, C. It's okay. This employee will not be fired, maybe even promoted if what, what he, he or she says is, 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 is correct. This lack of hierarchy enables people to speak their mind, which is also turns out to be um, very important when you want, when you want to build a, a kind of a startup ecosystem. Well, before, before we leave the term failure, um, Astro Teller, who's head of Google X last year, he came and spoke at my uh, event in San Francisco, and there's 500 of us there. I was on stage with him, and he says, I go and hug my employees or my team members when they fail, but we want them to fail fast. But it's really fascinating, and I think it's changing quickly here. It's okay to fail. What you learn from it? The milestones. But let me get back to a question um, in regards to winning. This may not be important to you because you probably will be licensing the rights around the world. But who's going to win? I don't think Tesla's going to win. Is it going to be the big three? Who's going to win that grabs the market share? That there's trust. And I want to get back to trust, too, because insurance companies know how to mitigate the risk. They understand what's going on here. So who's going to win, or do you care who's going to win? I, I don't think that there is going to be a uh, winner. The players in this field are 
tech players. We know about uh, Google. We know rumors about Apple. Uh, Uber is a, is a player. Uh, car manufacturers are a player. Some of them are doing it alone, like uh, General Motors. Uh, they bought a company and a startup a company, a Silicon Valley player, Cruise, and, and they're building autonomous cars on, on their own. And then the, the, the rest of the, the car makers are working with suppliers like uh, Mobileye. We have, for example, a partnership with BMW that was announced uh, last year. It's called the Vulcan Project, BMW, Mobileye, and Intel. It was even before the acquisition of Intel and Mobileye, where we are building together autonomous cars for 2021. We are building multiple partnerships around the world, which I'm not at liberty to announce, but hopefully in the next few months we'll, we will announce more such partnerships uh, like this, such that we influence a standard that will be good for everyone. Mm -hmm. Because without a standard, again, these cars would not be, uh, would not be on, the, uh, on the road. So I don't think there's going to be a winner. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's going to look like aviation industry. Mm -hmm. If you look at the aviation industries, all airplanes look alike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you believe in AI in regards, getting back to my situation, my Tesla, I think, has learned back to chaos, coming into a tunnel in Silicon Valley. It's learned to, to do the right thing. But also, I think what I have right now is hybrid, because when I have chaos, I take over the wheel. So do you believe in, uh, in Elon Musk and when he talks about they are inserting AI in their software programs, or is that sales? Well, the first autopilot of Tesla is mobilized uh, technology. And from what I read in Tesla forums, this is the, the highest experience so far in the Tesla cars. Right? All the rest is yet to be seen. Um, the current technology you see in, in Tesla is what is called level two. Mm -hmm. Level two, the problem with, with the level two is you need to communicate very, very clearly to the driver what are the limitations of, of the system. Because if you need to take control instantaneously, it could create a problem. It could create a problem that, that you trust the, the technology too much, you do something else, and when the time comes to take control, you don't do that uh, immediately. When people talk about autonomous driving, it's not the level two. It is the level three and above. So level three is when there is a takeover request. For example, Audi uh, A8, just introduced um, a uh, level three technology. It's together with the uh, Mobileye, um, where you have a 10 second takeover request. So it's not instantaneous under limited conditions. Mm -hmm. So when you're driving below 60 kilometers per hour, there is a lead car in, in front. What we're doing with other car manufacturers in level three, we're working with Honda and with Nissan and with, with other car manufacturers, that for the 2019, this kind of highway driving with a takeover request of 10 seconds will be done at highway speeds of about 130, 135 kilometers uh, per hour all over the world in Japan and Europe and, and, and the US. Then comes level four. Level four is, 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 is really a killer because now you are talking about no takeover request. Mm -hmm. Your mind is off completely. And level four means that there are certain modes that are not covered. Mm -hmm. For example, of a mode that is not covered, let's assume uh, left turn in a junction without a traffic light. This is called unprotected left. In that situation, you would say that this mode is not covered because there could be high speed traffic from the side. Your sensors do not see so far away, sufficiently far away on, on, on the side, and therefore this is not uh, covered. So it means that when you plan a route for point A to point B, you'll take left turns and junctions that have a traffic light. Mm -hmm. But when you are in the modes that are covered, you can simply have your minds off. Mm. Level five is all modes are covered. Okay? So when I talk about autonomous driving, I'm talking about level four, level five. Mm -hmm. So it, it is kind of a spectrum. Level two is what exists today, and one has to be very, very careful on how you communicate this to, uh, to the driver, because it could create issues. Right. And level three, level four, level five is where we start getting into autonomous so driving. So you flew over here. What do you think the percentage of time the pilots could rest and obviously enjoy autonomous driving and flying? Is it 90%, 100%, or they enjoy obviously landing and taking off? And that's first question, and where's the next vertical? Where's the next, 
what are we looking at 20 years from now? Obviously, trucks are going to be critically important next couple of years. But what's next above the car auto industry? But by the way, I don't believe in trucks. Mm -hmm. People talk about trucks. I, I don't believe in trucks. The reason I don't believe in trucks is because when you think about the truck, the Class 8 trucks, you know, the payload that they take is very, very expensive. The cost of a mistake is enormous. It's like a cruise missile. You know, this thing you know, hits infrastructure. The amount of damage that it can create is, is, is enormous. And the cost of the driver is negligible compared to the cost of what is being shipped. Therefore, there isn't an economic incentive, sufficient incentive mm -hmm. to replace uh, truck drivers. I, I believe it will go, it will start with passenger cars, like the Uber, the Lyft. Now, th th there are two markets for it. One is the mobility on demand, mm -hmm. in which really you want to have the driver not in the car. So I'm not talking about 90% of the time, we're talking about 100% of the time. There is no driver in the car, and this is the level four, level five. The second market... And cars will look com completely different. You'll be facing each other. You're not, you're not going yeah, this way. Yeah, just passengers. Yes. Just you're, passengers. You're passengers. Okay. And this opens up lots of additional verticals, like uh, sending content to, to the passengers, understanding what passengers are talking about, their body language, and trying to yes. send appropriate content and so forth. Then there is cars that we own. We buy a car. It could be more expensive than the regular cars, but it will have a higher utilization. I can take such a car, drive it to work, mm -hmm. and then send it back home. And then it will take other members of the household. So we'll, I'll need to have, instead of having two, three cars per household, one car would be sufficient. Maybe I'll share this car with my neighbor yeah. because the utilization is, is higher. So th this is where it is going. And this is where the impact, the economical impact, becomes so, uh, so significant. I think they say 7% of usage, your usage, for cars, that's all you're using it for the... 4%. For your, 4%. 4%. So I'm incorrect. So again, I asked you a question about verticals. Where is it going to go after, obviously, vehicles? What's, where, where is this technology going to take us 20 years from now? Well, when, when you look at, into artificial intelligence, where this is going in the areas of, of uh, moving people. So we're talking about cars. After cars, we are talking about uh, flying personal aircrafts that based on kind of the drone technology that can take you from your home to the airport yes. at a cost which is similar to a taxi uh, today, and it's not science fiction. You know, the control theory, the automation that we know how to do uh, today and in the near future can support something like this. That means I can own or travel in a vehicle, in an aircraft without having a, a pilot license. Uh, uh, this, this is where it is uh, going. Uh, drones in, in or, general. Or tunnels. Elon's talking tunnels. Uh, tunnels, yes. Elon has good ideas. Yeah. Um, so, you know, drones in general of, you know, um, shipping uh, packages. You're talking about mapping, which is much more significant than the types of maps that I talk today. Such a drone needs to know where balconies are located because you need to provide a package directly to the front door of, of uh, someone's uh, residence. So you need to map the world at much, much more detailed, not just the roads, but the buildings and, and where are launching pads, where, where you can land. This is the next, uh, the next uh, level. So if I may, if we can get questions from you, the Steve audience, uh, because there's obviously a lot of interest in this particular uh, industry. And uh, I think what we're talking about, I, I also, you know, we have offices up in Seattle, and it's fascinating to watch what they're doing with the drones with Amazon right now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, there's regulatory pressure everywhere in the world. I mean, here, we have regulatory pressure. We don't have Uber here yet. Right? So, we can talk about that. Yeah. So, questions from you. And I, is there a mic uh, in the... Amnon, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to see your presentation. Uh, you. you mentioned about the book, Startup Nation, right? So actually, I translate that book into Korean. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy to hear that, firstly. And uh, in that book, uh, the author mentioned a lot of time, the split of chutzpah. Yes. That's so the lack of authority. Yes. So could you explain a little bit about the chutzpah, the character of Israeli way of challenging? I mean, 
the, the, the author mentioned a little bit about the chutzpah, but it's kind of uh, challenging against impossible, something like that. But could you explain a little, a little bit further in detail about how chutzpah can uh, encourage your young generations and, to challenge and, and he's very modest, and we're, we, we want to know about your chutzpah, too. We want to know yeah. about your chutzpah, create this great company, acquisition with Intel. So talk yeah. about chutzpah. And it's mojo, it's courage, so please. So uh, chutzpah is, is lack of respect to authority, but it's not the lack of respect as, as a human being. You respect the other, the other person in front of you. It's lack of respect of the achievements that person has, 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 has arised to when you start debating. Because normally when, when we are debating, when we are in discussions, the, the achievements of the person in front of me is kind of intimidating. Therefore, I kind of cover myself and I don't express my opinions to the force that needs to be expressed in order to make my point. And Chutzpah says <clears throat> that, you know, forget about the achievements of the other person. Focus on, 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 on the moment. And I think it comes from the army culture. In the army culture, in the Israeli army, you don't lead by your rank. So say you are now a new uh, a company uh, commander or platoon uh, commander, and you have now a platoon. They will respect you based on your achievement and not based on your rank. And if you are not impressive enough to lead them, they will not go after you. And what will happen is that they are not going to be penalized. The commander is going to be replaced. Okay? So people say their, express their thoughts without being penalized, without being uh, uh, penalized across all, across all the, the, the processes in the Israeli society. It starts with the army, then goes to the workplace, gets, then goes to the university. You know, a professor, you know, you stand in front of a class of people and you say something which could be wrong and people tell you, no, I think that you are wrong. They'll, they'll not say, okay, he's a professor, I'm, I'm, whatever, whatever he says is, is comes from God. And I think it is healthy. You, you have to, there's of course a fine line in, in where if you cross it, you are not respecting the, the people in front of you. But as long as you don't pass this fine line, I think it is, it's, it is very helpful. It allows people to express their opinion. And sometimes, you know, the right direction doesn't come from the leader. Sometimes the right direction could come from this, you know, low level engineer that thought about the problem much more deeper than you have. And if you don't allow this engineer to express her or his opinion, then you're losing. Yeah. Uh, I believe in service, and I think our youth in America need to serve. I, I'm really respectful of what in Israel you serve in the army. Everybody does. And we have voluntary service. And it's just not service in the military, it's service. Maybe taking a gap year, you know, obviously working and helping and making an impact in your community. Service is, I think, important around the world. How our young kids can really appreciate and respect their country, whether it's Israel, Korea, America. Next question. Uh, thank you for your uh, a, a detailed you know, presentation. And I was wondering that the, when autonomous uh, driving was accomplished month, which agent will have a control? For example, the car, the device, some devices in the car will, have a, uh, a, a, will make a decision about the route or something in the cloud which have uh, the most profound data about surroundings will make a decision. But these kind of, some more debate is about the kind of a decision time is a so kind of a small. So somebody says that the, although that the, the cloud, uh, some you know, the, a agent in cloud will decide, but the decision time is so small, so some devices in the car should make such a decision. So what is your opinion? I, th I think it's an ex excellent question. Because time is a critical factor, you cannot allow decisions to be done in the cloud. 
So decisions of what do I want to do right now? How do I want to react to other agents around me? My planning, my sensing, all of this should be done on board. This is why you need high performance computing in, in the car. Things that can be done in the cloud is related to uh, mapping, routing, uh, collecting information from many other vehicles that are sending data and updating your uh, route. Just like it is today when you use Google Maps or Waze or Apple Maps, there is information being updated in the cloud all the time that is affecting the route that you are uh, planning. But the, the critical decision, the decisions that are about driving, the driving intelligence, the sensing, and, and the commands around them has to be done on board. And that is where a lot, a lot of intelligence, artificial intelligence, is located. Artificial intelligence in sensing, taking raw data, raw sensing data, and understanding the visual world, just like humans understand the visual world in terms of objects, what they are doing, semantic meaning, and also intelligence about planning, about making decisions of, uh, of driving, this kind of negotiation that I, that I talked about. All of this, all of that is it's time critical. You don't have the time for sending information to the cloud, getting back information in order to make. These are split-second decisions, and therefore, they must be in the car. So my perfect day is to be inspired and to learn. I've done both today, and I want to thank our esteemed speaker. If we can put our hands together, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your time. <laughs>